I think I might name this. Stan and Michael Hearn say, don't ever do cardio. The cardio itself may not be as important as the level of fitness or the level of strength. You'll die if you don't do 20 minutes of cardio five days a week. Those people have a decreased mortality risk. And no cardio ever. High blood pressure, high lipids, high blood sugar, all of those would get better from doing more cardio. Hey, I eat fish, I eat broccoli, I work out, I do cardio, I should be healthy, and they're not. I gotta be honest, it's not terribly effective for weight loss anyhow. Not everybody's born equal. We show on Instagram our top lift, and they don't see all the volume behind that. Use the tools when they're necessary that you have to use them. Don't use them all up too soon. I'm gonna piss a whole lot of people off here. Whew, that is gonna upset some people, I will say that. So, I wanted to go to you because I, I see such a large amount of cardio questions. Yeah. And, and uh, obviously, cardio can play, in my opinion, a big role in a lot of different ways. But I can also see that it's abused in a lot of different ways. And so, I wanted to kind of go to you because, again, I love the education self-taught in the sense of the experience that we both have but how we've used it how we haven't used it and i would like to start with just the bodybuilding and maybe fitness world on the aspect of people that eat pretty healthy so i don't want to talk about the average person yet i do want to get there because i do see that there's an issue with understanding how to use cardio for the person that's already maybe young already working out, already kind of active, playing basketball on the weekends. And then I'd like to move from there so the fans here can get it for the average Joe that maybe isn't active and how to use cardio the right way and wrong way. And I want to get your opinion on this. I'll probably put in some of my opinions and see what you think about those. And we'll go from there. But my take is really because you're such a big um from what I see, not just the digestion and getting up and getting moving, but you've incorporated in this stage of your career, and I think a very smart way to continue to do what you do and, and be smart with it. Compared to, I know for a fact, when you got ready for, I'm not sure what show it was, you, you came in, you were training with Flex. Um, I was always more enamored on you. I didn't care about the shows you were doing. I cared about you. So I know that you were training with Flex and he took you off of cardio and just made you train twice a day and you didn't do any cardio for a show. So I want to talk about the healthy person that's already active. Can you tell me about how they should use cardio and maybe how they shouldn't use cardio? That's great that you're making those distinctions because people always get uh, a little, uh, what would you say, territorial about cardio and cardio is a lot of things so it's really hard just to use the word cardio there are obviously health benefits um, and those vary as you mentioned between sedentary individuals as compared to active individuals uh, there's also uh, what phase of training that you're in off season or pre-contest so there's a lot of different things that'll go into this let's see if we can touch on a few uh, as far as you, you you already specified. Let's talk about the active training bodybuilder. Um, and I have to separate that from powerlifters because bodybuilders tend to do a lot more volume and frequency. And so they're already getting a significant amount of, of uh, what we call cardiovascular benefits, elevated heart rate uh, for you know longer periods of time, more frequently throughout the week. There's obviously a, a decreased mortality risk for maintaining a minimum level of cardiovascular fitness, which I, I think it's measured at about eight METs, uh, which is approximately the um, amount of uh, cardiovascular fitness that requires you to walk up maybe three flights of stairs with a bag of groceries and not fall over and pass out. Uh, so in my understanding that, that it's very small? It is pretty small. Uh, Would that also go to... smaller for a 20-year-old that's eating yeah. healthy compared to a 40-year-old that's eating healthy? This is a really interesting conversation. As of late, we've gotten a lot of research on this that suggests that the cardio itself, even as we talked about previously about the lifting itself, may not be as important as the level of fitness or the level of strength. 
there are people just by virtue of say their uh, genetics or their uh, work load, you know, maybe they're an active, have an active job. Uh, who maintain better than eight METs of cardiovascular fitness without having to do any cardio whatsoever. Um, they just through their leisure activities or whatever sporting event they're participating in, etc. Are you telling me that the studies don't incorporate them or, or they do incorporate them? Because of the studies I see is that everybody, no matter what you do, and this is just from, I guess, the tabloid guys, is that you have to do cardio because it's such a weak muscle that you'll die if you don't do 20 minutes of cardio five days a week. Uh, unfortunately, what we see, let's, uh, let's do it this way. Let's divide people up into uh, three groups, for instance. Okay. Uh, those people who have a, a measurable, say, VO2 max or uh, meet the uh, MET requirement of eight METs, uh, those people have a decreased mortality risk, and that be, say, your top third, people who's who are meeting the eight METs, even in the absence of doing cardio. And when you compare those to people who don't meet the eight METs but do cardio, the people who meet the eight METs and don't do cardio have a better longevity benefit, a decreased mortality risk, than the people who don't meet the eight METs and do cardio. So the cardio itself isn't necessarily the requirement or the say proxy or, or the, the uh, I would say the, uh, uh, the the best measure of health, it's the actual uh, measurable VO2 max that matters most. Uh, I hope that made sense. I don't know if I explained that. It in the does to me, and it, it, it does, it tremendously does to me again. And, and I, I think the that as we continue you and I to do these things, it's gonna break some of these people's mindsets because of the fact that you're saying not everybody's born equal not everybody has the same genetics and unfortunately not everybody fits the studies that were done and uh, i think that's great um, what would be the second so we got the the people that don't have to do cardio because they're set up pretty well by by the family or what they're doing or how they've lived their life compared to the people that have to do cardio in a sense somewhat um but um they don't active they're maybe not as active or it's just their body function what would be the middle group of that the middle group would be the people who lift weights and just by virtue of the fact that they're lifting weights have achieved the minimum number of you know the eight mets a week such that they don't need to do any additional cardio and this is for the health benefit okay and then the third group is going to be the folks that do lift weights and still, even with that activity, don't haven't met the eight METs uh, requirement for the decreased mortality risk. And those people would want to do some additional cardio uh, to improve their fitness. So that's kind of the, how I look at the three groups. And then there's a lot of nuance in terms of whether or not the additional cardio um, helps them with their sport or with prepping for competition. That's a completely different com uh, conversation because some people uh, you know, endurance athletes, etc., would do more cardio simply to perform better in their sport. Uh, or even as, uh, you know, bodybuilders have to have a minimum, uh, I wouldn't even say it's a minimum, but it, it's just that they're more effective if they have a, a, a better GPP, general physical preparedness, if they have better cardiovascular fitness that allows them to do more volume and frequency and recover faster uh, so they can, they can train more. We even see it in powerlifting. This is particularly important. I think, you know, Before I have to go to powerlifting. I, I have to, I got to ask you one question about this basic, these three first, before we go to okay. the powerlifting idea. Okay. Um, because I think one thing too, that you've always said, and you talk about it a lot, and I love that you say this, is that you start a half an hour cardio January 1st, and then you do that every day until December 31st, a half an hour. What happens during that time, that half an hour that you're doing and you do it so much throughout the year? Is it the same benefit from day one is day 365? Now, that kind of takes us back to the original conversation. It's not necessarily the fact that you're doing it, but whether or not you got a, a, a benefit from it. 
The same thing would be true of weightlifting. We, we could break people up into tiers based on strength and their longevity benefit based on strength. The stronger people live longer, whether they lift as often as the weaker people or not. It's not the lifting itself. It's not the cardio itself. It's the outcome that's derived from it. And that takes us back to that previous conversation we had about exercise versus training. And, uh, you know, sometimes people will go in and they'll do a little bit of everything, but a whole lot of nothing. It's not measurable or progressible. And you have to achieve some level of fitness or some level of strength in order to, uh, to benefit from that or, or obtain that longevity benefit, to be a part of that group that's going to live longer or be stronger. And uh, so it's not just the activity itself, which is, is why I'm a pretty big proponent of things being measurable and progressible. Right. Uh, and I'm outcome oriented. So I don't I don't just want people going to the gym and doing Metcons and jumping up and down for no reason. I want to actually be able to measure, measure. The, the outcome on that. That's great information. Is there, uh, I guess, a diminishing return for some people if they continuously do that? And their goal would be to put on muscle or to stay healthy. Is there a dim diminishing return by not changing or just staying with the, hey, I do four days, 20 minutes? Uh, well, now we're back to the original conversation where we said there's three groups of people, those that don't really need cardio. Now you're asking yourself, what's the opportunity cost of that? What else could you be doing? What alternative activity could you be doing? You know, and, and I always said the best exercise is the one you'll do. If you enjoy the cardio, yes. do, do the cardio. That's first and foremost. Uh, but secondarily, what benefit are you deriving from it? If you have already achieved your eight Mets, uh, then you really don't need to invest any more energy into that. You're probably not going to get any more benefit unless you're an athlete using it for you know sports performance. Uh, so now what's the opportunity cost? Does that compromise your ability to spend that time doing something that might better improve uh, your health, which, you know, as, as we promote, it would be strength training. If it comes at the sacrifice of that and you're to create a priority, I mentioned the second group of people who would lift weights and not do any cardio, but maintain the eight Mets in the absence of the necessity of cardio that would never have to do cardio and, and, and shouldn't be considered to be unhealthy because uh, just by virtue of, of, you know, their genetics and their workload and their training, they've already achieved that level of, of cardiovascular fitness that's going to give them the health benefit. And so it's, it's, it's unnecessary with respect to health. Now we can have all they... the other things. How would these three categories test themselves for, in your best recommendation to go, hey, I sit at this level. Maybe cardio is not the best thing for me that much. My weightlifting is doing it, the, the, the diet, and then my active, active lifestyle is doing it as well. Compared to the individual that maybe doesn't do cardio, that wants to find out how to get tested, to know that, hey, I, I am one of those that needs to do cardio a little bit more. Well, obviously, if there's any metabolic conditions, high blood pressure, high lipids, high blood sugar, all of those would get better from doing more cardio. Uh, weight loss would also be a great uh, you know, intervention for those things as well. But cardio itself could improve uh, their, their... Now, I do want to make it clear that we're talking about, just so the viewers understand, these three categories here, they're all eating pretty well. They're eating like competitors we haven't got to the average joe yet and they're all still in that different category and again I, he's going to break it down on things that some people that eat well still have high blood pressure people that train still have high blood pressure and so there's there's yeah, that take where everybody's healthy just because i train i do hey i eat fish i eat broccoli i work out i do cardio i should be healthy and they're not yeah and again, those folks who either through blood testing or through blood pressure check uh, could find out if their lipids were elevated, or their blood sugars were elevated and then implement a, uh, you know, a program that would specifically address those. But as far as, you know, fit individuals who are training on a regular basis, uh, I, I find very few of them that need more cardio unless it's for a specific purpose other than health, because they've already they've already uh, achieved the health benefit from cardio. They might use it. Uh, you know, start ramping it up pre-contest for some people that just want to increase their their workload. But even then, I'm cautious about how many calories does a 40-minute or one-hour bout of cardio burn acutely, and how does it affect through compensation the 24-hour non-exercise activity uh, calorie burn? We talked about how people, if they try and train too hard, they go home and they sit more and eat more. Um, 
so so that's a consideration. I'd I'd start by increasing step count. You know, stay on your feet, get up to 10,000, 12,000, 14,000, sometimes 15, 16,000 steps gradually as you go into the last eight weeks of, of competition prep. And that would prevent you from having to do a significant amount of cardio. And then what's the What's the intensity of the cardio? You know, if you're trying to stay in zone three and four, the lactic zone too often, you're going to crush yourself with fatigue and not be able to train with the right intensity to maintain your lean body mass. You'll just be too tired and not have the energy to work out hard enough. So we would keep the cardio list, low intensity, steady state in that case. Uh, and, you know, increase the, as I usually do, and I recommend to my clients, increase the frequency of the workouts you know start doing an am pm training session work lift weights for 40 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes at night before introducing additional cardio well before uh, you go on hold on now why did you when you were training with flex uh, pull off the cardio and just train weights twice a day well i have a, a relatively fast metabolism and so i would lose muscle pretty quickly or size i wouldn't be able to eat enough calories to hold my weight uh, plus the obviously the stimulus just being able to do more volume and frequency throughout the week uh, the the trainings the sessions get to be so intense that you know once you get past say 45 minutes certainly after an hour you mentioned earlier you get to the point of diminishing returns and you're also dramatically increasing the fatigue and kind of digging a bigger hole from which for you to recover uh, and we talked previously about using low fatigue movements to try and manage some of that but just, you know, just the workout itself, the amount of sets and reps that you have to get in to meet and exceed the, the prior bouts uh, is, is enough to where if you break those up and put a nap and a couple of meals in between and then you come back at night and train, uh, the training stimulus is going to drive, you know, lean body mass retention and growth, especially pre-contest when you're at a calorie deficit. And the, uh, the extra cardio I got to be honest, it's not terribly effective for weight loss anyhow. We see that in the in the regular population uh, as compared to, say, just NEAT because of the compensatory effect and your body's uh, ability over time to kind of uh, it burn. It'll become more efficient and burn fewer calories per minute invested in it. Say that again. Well, when just you that do last couple sentences there. Yeah. When you do cardio consistently, your body gets better at it and it just starts to become more efficient and you'll burn fewer calories per minute or per hour doing the same exercise that you did a week or a month or two months prior. Stop there for a second. Let me just dive in here for a moment. I put out a video a few years back and somebody wanted to edit it and, and say, Michael Hearn said, no cardio ever. It's not what I said. You know that. Right. My point is, I always go back to the Batman belt. I got a lot of tools on this thing. I'm not going to use all of them at the same time. I got to look like this for a certain project. I need to save some of that for the time to get ready so I can peak. Now, obviously, I haven't competed since the 1920s. But the point there is that I understand that I need to go for me off season and, and try to build as much and also recoup some of the muscle I lost dieting all year as we guest post so much. Yeah. But I also have to use some of the tools and save those. And so my point to the video was try not, if you're a healthy person, you, you eat right, you're active and everything, don't do additional cardio. Save these tricks for the diet to get ready for the show. And the reason I say that is because you just saw me a few months ago and you probably didn't even recognize me. But in 12 weeks, I'm ready to do a Hollywood movie playing a 38-year-old. So the difference between a fat person and a bulky person is one metabolism is functioning and walks in and can do a movie where the other one's lost 20, 30 pounds, maybe over a three-month period. So someone edited it and said, Mike said, never do cardio. Um, your take on me getting ready for this project where I took – nine months off of cardio, made sure to feed my body, not just the muscle, but the connective tissue with different proteins, the body, get the body used to carbohydrates again. Cause as you know, I treat it differently during diets and it's going to rebound and blow up. It's not that my body doesn't like carbs. It's just not used to them. Yeah. So my take was let's be smart about this. Let's not burn ourselves out. This is the long game. 
and, and Stan and I have been here for a while and we want to teach these people that. And how do you talk to these people that go, the tabloid guys say, hey, don't ever do it. And we got Stan Effort in here going off of studies, going off of experience um, and also respect through the industry. Everybody respects you and likes you and you got a great sense of humor. <laughs> so how would you address these guys that go, they jump onto, I don't know, I hate using this term, but it's religion to them. You have to do this. You have to eat this way. You have to do cardio. You have to do this. How do you talk to those individuals and say, it's probably not in your best interest to do it all the time because of what you just said prior to this. And you guys should all go back and listen to the statement he says. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head when you said you got to keep uh, some tools in your toolbox or some ammunition in your gun. Uh, unfortunately, I get a lot of competitors that will come to me a month out from a show and they'll already be at, at uh, a very substantial oh. calorie deficit and they'll already be doing two 40 or 50 minute bouts of cardio a day and they'll they'll need help because they've stalled their progress is stalled and there's nothing you can you can't decrease calories anymore and you can't increase do you have cardio a term anymore. for that do you uh, have a term because I, I i i have a term i always call it like we've used up all the tricks yeah we've used yeah. Up all the little things to trick the body to continue to get rid of the fat and retain the muscle yeah and oftentimes though when when they come to me at that point they've lost some muscle uh, yeah, with yeah. with the excess cardio and and, in, and the calorie deficit, uh, which is, uh, I mean, that's 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 one of the worst things that can happen. And it's a little late at that point. Uh, there's not a lot I can do there. I generally tell them just to stay on their feet as much as they can, increase their step count, and then pull out one of the cardio sessions and replace it with a workout, like we talked about earlier. And that and 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 start trying to invest more into lifting uh, heavier, uh, uh, not one or three rep maxes, but just um, I think people get caught up with the number of sets that they do. And did I tell you to say that, or did you say that? I, I'm. This is what what I say, and and I and I I think that you and I have lived through this enough times and made these mistakes ourselves enough times, and are privy enough to the uh, to the mistakes made by the hundreds and hundreds of people that we've worked with over the years. I want the viewers uh, to know. I don't tell him. I couldn't tell Stan what to say on my point of views and my beliefs. I couldn't do that. He, Stan has his own opinions. But there's so many factors of you and me that are deep rooted that we understood we made those mistakes. Yep. We found out the problem to them and we stayed with it is the heavier weight as you're getting ready for the show. And it's not the two or three reps. It's more reps, obviously. Yeah. I love the fact that you pulled in a second workout prior yeah. to maybe pulling in cardio. And and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, as I was as I was mentioning. A lot of people get caught up with they have to do 10 sets of, uh, you know, of this, you know, maybe three different exercises, four sets of each to get their 12 sets in. Well, if you're pre contest and you're in a significant calorie deficit and your carbs are reduced and you've lost a lot of weight, the intensity of those sets is, is going to go way down. And so you lose a lot of muscular endurance first, first and foremost. Uh, but the strength can stay with you for a much longer period of time. It's just not going to, you're not going to be able to be in the gym for an hour. It's just not, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll crash. And so I would, I would pour more energy into intensity at that point and try and lift a little heavier with a little lower repetitions for a, a little bit fewer sets and then break it up into two workouts so that you can at least have a little bit of energy for the second training session. That's a strategy. Obviously, the walking is a strategy, trying to get those, that step count way up. Uh, hopefully, they haven't decreased their protein too substantially. Usually, you can throw in a few extra calories of protein and not uh, incur any, any fat gain from it. Uh, I'm not saying that, that they don't count, but it, it's less likely that you'll gain fat from adding protein than other macros. And so that's, that's always a challenge. And then, you know, depending on the athlete, some folks... Um, you know, when they start doing a bunch of cardio, they lean out, they, their legs start getting thin and, uh, you know, the, the shorter, thicker guys can get away with it. But uh, uh, if you're taller and got longer legs, I just they just start to get real wispy after a while. You're uh, I love how you break it down and simply uh, give both sides of this. And again, this is uh, 
years of experience of being in the trenches in the arena i guess you would i like saying that we've been in the arena we've been in the battles we've we've competed in powerlifting bodybuilding other stuff um i always i got lucky enough as you know to do gladiators in the 90s do uh late 80s 90s um battle dome in 2000s and then come back to gladiators again and i would always prep for it the same way i did football I would always start 12 weeks out and I would be off season before that, get my strength to the most pinnacle it could be, and then try to restrain, try to retain as much yep. strength because it didn't matter if I could run fast. The reason why I was a gladiator and undefeated is because I was strong and athletic and fast. And so I needed to keep all those aspects. And I understood that I wasn't an idiot. I know why I got the show, but I also knew that, I'm going to be destroyed during the eight weeks of filming. So I needed to come into that clean, ready to go, uh, fired up. And I knew if I did cardio for six months before and started running and doing drills and fours and all those kind of stuff, I would have nothing for the show. Because then I realized I would fight three to six guys a day by myself. And it's like one after another. Then those guys just had to go against one. So it's a different world. But it worked for me to go 12 weeks like you said, use the thing. Now, trial and error, I got to do it for 30 years, so trial and error. Some seasons I did it right, some seasons I didn't. I couldn't do it over and over again the exact same. I was changing. I was in my 20s, then I was in my 30s, then I was in my 40s, and so I had to continue to change and be smarter. And I, I want the fans to know that that's, I think, for me, I am one that admits I have learned more in the circle of people I've been around the last 10 years than I probably did the first 35 years of my career. Um, and also it's the experience that we've lived and we're at this pinnacle now that there's a small group of people that talk and you talk about heavier weights. Agreed. Use the tools when they're necessary that you have to use them. Don't use them all up too soon. And that's the most layman terms I can put it for you guys. Um, Stan, you're incredible. I love these shows with you, and the fans absolutely love you, and you're a freaking stud. So any final states on this one? Because we don't have enough time to go to the power lifts. I want to do that next time. I want to talk about the guys that just want the strength, the power, and to, and to bulk how to use cardiovascular to make sure that they're healthy. Because I had a big talk with Lee Haney the other day, and it's like you and me, are, I, think, I think, I know people know that we lift heavy but I don't think they realize that we've been athletes and can yep. move and groove and, and we want longevity. Yeah. And you know, we show on Instagram our top lift and they don't see all the volume behind that, uh, you know, that, that we do to support that. And uh, uh, a lot of that volume is, you know, just variations of that exercise, lower fatigue, higher repetitions, uh, you know, and then obviously the frequency that goes with that. And we don't max out every time. We, we, you know, we, we break that up. I use, quote unquote, cardio, not necessarily for fat burning. I, I use it to improve my GPP so I can train harder and longer. I use it for uh, recovery. I'm not a big fan that you've heard me say before that things that are done to you or for you are not as effective as things you do for yourself. Well, and... You said it before, but just so the, the people that may not understand, are you talking about like cold plunges and massages? What are 100%. you hundred percent? Yeah. And that's been studied. What I refer to as passive therapies. And that's, and again, I'm going to piss a whole lot of people off here. Uh, but those are really just facilitators of movement, the movement itself. Uh, that would be massage, ART, static stretching, foam rolling, needling, cryotherapy, gua sha, manual therapy. I mean, the list goes on and on cupping, all of that stuff is fine. If you want to do it, if it makes you feel good, that's a great reason. But there's no science that suggests there's a physiologically measurable benefit to it. Uh, and it all pales in comparison to any type of movement. So I move often. That's why I love the 10-minute walks or, you know, just getting on a recumbent bike and blasting out some, uh, you know, spinning on that for a while just to put blood into the muscles. And it's not just because the blood, you know, helps... Uh, send you know a lot of healing nutrition, but also because the lymphatic system has no pump, and you need to get all the 
waste materials out, and that only happens with movement. And so uh, I think movement is first. All that other stuff's great, so long as the understanding is that it facilitates movement. Uh, and it, it's Before not, you go on, my, I, I don't do the walks. I do the swims. Those are fantastic. Um, Any I, I love the swims because I do two things. I swim, and I guess this is called butterfly, I guess. Yeah. I, so um, I like doing that for two reasons. One is I love that rotation through the shoulder, pulling it, and I kind of like flex through it and flex the back, but I like the rotation of in the water, moving that angle, um, and then also just the whole body functioning like that. And then it's also my time with Titan. So we'll swim twice a day. I usually swim first thing in the morning and then usually last thing at night. And it's also nice because the drop in temperature of the body of getting out of the water puts me into a nice little, I can go right to sleep. Yeah. Um, so, but again, I agree with you on, on, on what it does to recovery. We both agree on movement. I do do the other things cause I like them. I don't mind uh, uh, getting a massage. It feels good. But I agree with you that it's, it's the movement yourself. Yeah. And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not damning any of those interventions. I just don't like when those people try and identify somebody with some sort of pathology that requires their intervention. All those interventions are somewhat equivocal. Uh, I've said, said before in, in terms of pain that, that whatever intervention that someone's using, uh, you know, pain resolves itself spontaneously within four to six weeks. And so whatever intervention they're using, when the pain spontaneously resolves, people will attribute the resolution and the pain resolution to that intervention, even if it's something, uh, you know, as innocu innocuous as wearing a, uh, you know, a, a wristband or something, one of those uh, copper wristbands. <laughs> so uh, it's placebo, but placebo is real. It's psychological. It just doesn't have a measurable physiological benefit. And so uh, I just don't want for individuals to feel as though they're unable to move without someone manually manipulating them, which creates some pathology that uh, that is unnecessary because the, the movement is important. I don't know if this show is better or, or for the fans today or just for me. Man, I love talking to you and everything. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you having me on, on the uh, comments. Ought to be ought to be good on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might name this Stan and Michael Hearn say, "Don't ever do cardio." <laughs> sure, I made some enemies. We'll see what happens. You can't. You're too sweet. They all hate me though, but I'm looking for new haters because the old ones like me now. All right, brother. Thanks, brother. Have a great day today. You too. Take care. Crush, crush Gavin. I mean, like, like make him throw up. That's light work. I know. See you, buddy. <laughs> All right, brother. Wow. Wow. Man. Whew. That is going to upset some people. I will say that. It shouldn't, though. It's not a religion. Cardio is not a religion. And, and understanding how the body functions and how your body functions is the point of why we're bringing you this. So don't get upset. Empty the cup. Like Bruce Lee said, is your cup too full? Empty it. Listen to what he's saying. Don't, don't listen to respond. That does nothing to anybody, and you're not learning anything. Listen to what he said and, and the studies he's done, but also the, the mistakes that he and I have made, and not just we have made. Listen, I've trained with Arnold. I've trained with all the legends that you guys read about, um, and they gave me their advice. And this is a, an accumulation of thousands of people and hours of information for you guys to help you. And it does override your favorite Instagram tabloid guide. It does override those kind of things. And it also overrides the guy that reads everything and applies nothing. Those guys are as well, not necessary the per people to listen to. There's some great people out there to listen to. Again, it, it really does come down to how does your body function? And, you know, is it good to have in all year? It's obviously not great for everybody. Find out what's best for you. That's the main thing here. That's, we're trying to give you that information. Kick ass on this. This is health and fitness. We got to make this a old school community again, the golden era. We're bringing it back. Thanks for watching today, man. Um, we'll see you next week.